So I have two issues that I want to deal with in this segment, de-escalation and proportionate. Well, let's start with de-escalation. You need to know the definition of de-escalation under Massachusetts law, because that's what you're going to be asked about, right? If you go to a community meeting, first question I'm going to ask you as a citizen, like, you know, what does de-escalation mean? I've heard about a lot of, about de-escalation and policing. You know, can you describe it? What does the law say? When you get to court and you run into a smart ass attorney like me, officer, did you put your hands on my client? Yeah. Did you try and de-escalate? Yeah. What's the definition of de-escalation? What did you do? Right? So let's really focus on this. Let's get it where we can talk about this, whether we're in a community setting or we're in a legal setting. So first thing is, when you read the definition of de-escalation in Chapter 60, Section 1, it says your goal is to gain voluntary compliance or reduce force. Why is that important? Because there's this myth out there, right? What's the, what's the citizen myth? Boy, if only the cop said the right thing, he wouldn't have had to shoot him. If only the cop said the right thing, you wouldn't have had that reason. If only the officer knew just the right thing to say, then you never would have had to struggle with Johnny defendant putting the handcuffs on. And you know, as a professional, that's not true. Sometimes despite your best efforts, you have to go hands-on. So one of the things that's important is that you are able to say in court, you're able to say in your community, look, our goal is to gain voluntary compliance. But you know what? Sometimes despite our best efforts, we end up having to go hands-on, but you know what? We try when we can. When it's feasible, when it's realistic, we will talk with the person. We will try different strategies. And we also know it works. I bet if I sat down with you, I could come up with a case where you would say, well, you know, John, I tried to do A, I tried B, and then I had to go hands-on. But you know what? If I hadn't have made the effort to talk to Johnny defendant, it would have been worse than it was. So the goal is not perfection. But the goal is, if you can, to make what happened more peaceful. The other thing is, you will see that de-escalation is defined as proactive. What does proactive mean? Look it up in the dictionary. Controlling a situation by causing something to happen. Now, I understand a lot of officers think like, ah, oh, you know, well, it's something else now. Another burden. John, oh, gee, de-escalate. I'm just going to sit in my cruiser and do nothing. You know what? Sometimes it is good to be passive. I always tell the same story, but, you know, it just comes to mind in these situations. You know, <laughs> send me an email with something that you've experienced. I love hearing stories of de-escalation that worked and failed. It helps us learn. But here's my experience, right? So I'm on a flight and we get diverted to Fort Lauderdale. And then people are pissed because not only do we have to rebook our flight, but we have to pay more <laughs> to get back to where we were trying to get to, right, Boston. And so people are mad. And I see a Fort Lauderdale officer and he's just standing behind the ticket counter like this. And people are, you know, raising their voices. And then all of a sudden, one guy kind of leans over the ticket counter and he's doing one of these, you know, the pointing and the loud voice. And you see the officer come forward and he just goes, uh uh, back up. Will you listen? Back up. And you see the air come out of the balloon. The guy calms down a little bit. He backs up. And then you see the officer go back to where he was standing like this. And I think that's great policing. Now, you could look at him and say, he didn't do anything. Yeah, but you know what? He strategically didn't do anything. He understood the minimum intervention necessary under the circumstances. Now, obviously, if that person had gone in the other direction, of course, maybe it would have been sterner words, and who knows? 
Maybe we would have seen him on the ground in cuffs if it really got bad. But the point is this, you may be passive, you may be active, but whatever you are, it's got to be strategic. And if you want to use that word instead of proactive, then I recommend that word, right? De-escalation is a strategy that you're expected to employ. Now, what are the specific things that you do when you try and de-escalate? These are actually in the definition in the statute. Now, do you think the legislators came up with them on their own? Of course not. They talked with good cops like you, and they learned verbal persuasion, warnings, slowing down the pace of an incident. Um, you know, I remember riding with some officers in framing. I love riding with you guys, right? I rode with some officers in framing him. Brilliant at just slowing down incidents, getting people to calm down, just their positioning, their presence, waiting out a person, right? Now, again, all of this has to be realistic. You know, if I, I you always use the same example, right? If I'm if I'm on my neighbor's porch at 3 a.m., drunk out of my mind, it could happen, screaming at the top of my lungs. You know, yeah, you'll find people who go like, dude, why don't you just wait him out? Like, let him. Be. And there's some point you know, like, look, hey, you know what? The neighborhood has rights too. <laughs> so you know what? Yeah, we showed up, we tried to coax him off the porch, and now we're going to go up and pull him off, and you know, handcuff him. So yeah, it's realistic, but you know what? There are times when you can wait out a person, of course. Creating a distance between the officer and the threat. So some of you may have attended what's called ICAT, Integrated Communication and Tactics. It was a class developed by PERF, which is the Police Executives Research Forum. And I actually attended an ICAT class. It was taught by Lieutenant Mike Sonia, the state police. Really well done, right? Great curriculum. But you know what? If you said to me, John, hey, I heard you went to ICAT. What's ICAT in 20 seconds? Here's ICAT in 20 seconds. If you have somebody with a weapon, obviously not a gun, that's a different story, but they got a baseball bat or a knife or something, right? You have somebody with a weapon, somebody posing a threat, create distance communicate with them, two things are going to happen. Either they're going to surrender or you will have time to get the resources you need. So when you do need to go hands-on, you're going to have a decisive and successful result. That's what I learned from ICAT. Does that make sense to you? Of course it does. You've been in that situation. Requesting additional resources. I think one of the best things that has happened in policing in the last 10 years is what we call co-response, where cops are actually going to incidents with a mental health clinician in the cruiser, right? So I, you know, my own hometown of Arlington, our, our police department has a clinician, Rebecca Wolf, she'll ride with the officers. Uh, and she can do follow-up casework. You know, one of the things that's tough now is some people, you know, use 911 as their mental health provider. And we can talk about the social reasons why that happens. But, you know, the point is you're at the tip of the spear. When they call you on 911, you will go. Can you get support from a mental health clinician? Can they be with you? Can you have access to them on the phone? Or at the very least, can you have some kind of relationship with a mental health clinician who can go the next day and start to provide the family with options and resources and casework so that it doesn't have to be a 911 intervention in the future? This has been wildly successful in policing and the money in the state budget to support these efforts in policing has been doubled in the past year. So definitely keep using that resource. And I'll throw one more thing in. I think it's really important. The departments that I see where this works well, they make sure they have clinicians who understand police culture, are practical, you know, are willing to you know, get their mental health hands dirty. Those are people that you want in the cruiser with you. Those are people that you want doing the follow-up casework. 
So it's really important to get a good fit between the clinician and the department. Hey, can you come up with your own approaches? What are the things that work for you? Uh, the other day I was, you know, I did some training and I was with a, a sergeant and he was just really interesting in sort of talking about different cases where he's de-escalated and kind of what his approach is and what he tries to teach the younger officers. Um, you know, there's just so much room in this area for improvement, for professionalism, for practicing your craft. All right. What else am I going to talk about? Let me talk about proportionate. So I have a question for you. What is the best definition of proportionate when it comes to use of force? Are you ready? Have you thought about it? Well, I found a case recently. I think this is the best definition of proportionate. And I think you're going to be a little bit surprised. It's Jennings versus Jones. It's a 2007 case. It's in the first circuit, which is the circuit that covers us in Massachusetts and the other states in New England. And what was the answer? The use of force continuum. I love this. I love this. When you go to the community meeting, when you are in court, when you have an attorney up your ass cross-examining you, well, what's the standard for force in Massachusetts? Proportionate. What does proportionate mean, officer? Proportionate means what it has meant my entire police career, the use of force continuum. The use of force continuum. Now, what is it that we know about the use of force continuum? First of all, it is a reaction to the subject's behavior. And I'll tell you right now, if you go visit the departments that I've advised who have policy manuals and you say, can I see your use of force policy? They're gonna say, we don't have a use of force policy. We have a response to resistance policy. That's what I'd like you to call your use of force policy, a response to resistance, because that is police use of force. The subject, is essentially controlling what you are doing when everything is working, when you are at the height of your professionalism. Isn't that what you're doing? You're anticipating, of course, you're ready, but the application of force is in response to the subject's behavior. You know what we call that? We call that proportionate. When was the use of force continuum developed? Well. Again, legend has it, and I, you know, with all these things, you know, you may find some officer who says, no, I really developed it, but it is attributed to Dr. Franklin Graves, who came up with this model in 1997. So if you are a 25 year veteran of policing, this is basically all you have ever known. So when somebody says to you, oh, watch out officer, right? They got a new standard for use of force in Massachusetts. It's called proportionate. You look at that person and you say, it's not a new standard. It's the standard I've been using for the last 25 years, and it's called the use of force continuum. Now, what's interesting about Jennings versus Jones is basically this case dealt with a Rhode Island police officer who was arresting an individual. Jennings, who sued, later sued, and everybody agreed Jennings resisted, and everybody agreed that the Rhode Island officer appropriately applied what is called an ankle turn technique, okay? We don't need to be technical. He basically grabbed the guy's foot, and he turned the ankle, and that hurts like hell, right? As a former high school wrestler, I know that one. That hurts, and the guy basically said, okay, okay, hey, I got a bad ankle, and immediately complied. Now, if that is you, what do you do? You know, under the use of force continuum, if force goes down, if the threat decreases, then you adjust your force. 
okay, maybe you maintain the ankle turn until the handcuffs are on. Maybe you decrease the ankle turn, but you don't do what this officer did. You don't increase it and break the guy's ankle. That's called excessive force. And so again, the expectation is not perfection. This isn't fight club. Hey, you know, you have a knife, I have a knife. Hey, you throw a punch, I throw a punch. It's not perfection, it's proportionate. Hey, use of force continuum. What's your behavior? What's gonna be my behavior in response to neutralize the threat and get control of the situation? All right, hey, I hope that was helpful to you.